Well, good evening. My name is Bishop Edwin M. C. Brookman. Um, you're welcome to uh, the teachings on the prophetic ministry. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of questions within the body of Christ about the prophetic ministry, and there are a lot of Buha really going on as to whether the prophetic is from the Lord or not. And there's so many discussions have gone on, but I think that um, as one of the pioneers of the prophetic ministry in Ghana, in my country, I believe it's incumbent uh, that I share some few thoughts on the prophetic, which I believe will be a blessing to uh, the body of Christ. I always tell people that um, we're not supposed to show an away from the prophetic after hearing all the negativities that are really um, surrounding the prophetic ministry, what we're supposed to do is to teach authentic, word-based sound um, um, teachings that can bring the balance, you know, a, a false balance and abomination unto the Lord, but I just wait, the Bible says it's, 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 it's light. Um, that there are counterfeit dollars that does not stop us from spending the one. So certainly there are genuine prophets and we have to really teach some word to really help and bring the balance. Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And so here Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus and spoke about what we call today the fivefold ministry. And he emphatically said that the fivefold ministry is the ministry is given to the church by Christ Jesus for these four reasons. Number one, for the keeping of the saints for the work of ministry. I believe we all have to be equipped. You know, a man is equipped so he can really have enough capacity to contend with situations and to really have his hands on whatever he's been called to do um, as God's child. And so with the ministers in the fivefold ministries are there to equip God's people so they can have their hands on to do what they've been called to do. Again, for the edifying of the body of Christ, there has not been any time where the body of Christ needs to be edified than these times that we find ourselves in, particularly within this uh, pandemic. And then we have the third reason why the fivefold ministries are given. So we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And the fourth reason that we should no more be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every way of doctrine um, by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plottings. You know, so um, these are the basic reasons why we need the fivefold ministries uh, in the body of Christ. Now, somebody will ask. The what is the fivefold ministry this man is talking about? I just read about it from Ephesians 4 11. He gave some to the apostles. And this is what we have here the apostle. We call the apostolic ministry. Some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, pastors, and then teachers. So here we have the apostolic ministry. Some to be apostles. We have the prophetic ministry, some to be prophets. Evangelist ministry, some to be evangelists. Pastoral ministry, some to be pastors. And then teaching ministry, some to be teachers. For the perfection of the same. As time permits, I will be taking you through all these five-fold ministries, one after the other. That's why we said five ways of identifying your calling. By the time I'll be done sharing with you one after the other, these five-fold ministries, you'll be able to probably identify uh, what your calling is. We want to deal with, first of all, the apostolic ministry. The apostolic ministry. Who is an apostle? An apostle is a sent one from God to fulfill a mandate. 
So Matthew 10, the verses 1 and 2. And when Christ had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power of unclean spirit to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, and then it went on and on and on. But I want to mention the bit that says that and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power of our unclean spirit to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Now the names of the 12 apostles, so these were apostles, but they were sent with a particular mandate to be fulfilled. And that mandate was to have power of unclean spirit, cast out unclean spirit, heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. This was their mandate. And so an apostle is a sent one from God to fulfill a mandate. Every apostle has some signs that identifies him or her as an apostle. So we want to look at the signs of the apostle. The first sign is in Romans chapter 1 verse 1. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So the first sign of the apostle is that the apostle must be called and separated and sold out to the gospel of Christ. So Paul reiterated this by saying that Paul, a bond servant of Jesus, called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God. And we need people who have been separated, consecrated to preach the gospel. The second sign of the apostle, apostles walk in signs and wonders. Apostles, they walk in signs and wonders. What is a sign and what is a wonder? A sign is an event that occurs to indicate the probable presence of something. It is also an action used to convey an information or an instruction to a people. So when an apostle comes around, he walks in signs and wonders to be able to indicate the probable presence of the God that he represents. It's also an action used to convey. So he walks in signs to convey an information and instruction. He comes to tell you Jesus heals. He has to demonstrate it. He comes to tell you that God performs miracles. He has to demonstrate it. That is the sign of an apostle. And so, um, a buttress in scripture, Acts chapter 2, verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord working with them, and confirming the word through their company signs. Amen. And that is the work, the sign of the apostle. Now let's look at the next sign of the apostle. Apostles always want to do ministry um, in places where Christ has not been preached. You see, uh, I see some people who all they do is to witness uh, to Christians who are in some churches to move from some churches into their churches. These are not real apostles. Real apostles will always want to take the bull by the horn. They believe that God has called them to a particular place. They go there. They don't take other people's. These days, they've been recycling. One person leaves one church to the next. But real apostles, they go to barren virgin grounds and they break the grounds and wind souls and establish ministries in those places. And so Romans 15, 20. Romans 15, 20. And so I have made it my aim. This is Paul preaching, an apostle. He said, I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named. Least I should build on another man's foundation. That's the work of the apostle. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14 and 16. For we are not over extending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors. But have we hoped that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you 
in our sphere to preach the gospel in the region beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishments. Apostles wouldn't want to boast in another man's, another man's accomplishment. They always want to come and break the ground and get the work started for the Lord. The next sign of a true apostle is that <clears throat> there are always apostles are always willing to suffer for Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 14 to 16. For we are not of extending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure. That is in our um, in another man's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged. So they love it when they go through a lot of things for um, 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 the gospel's sake. Uh, in, in, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 19 through 28, the Apostle Paul talks about the things that he went through as an apostle. He said, For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage. And one further said that if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face to our shame, I say that we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly. I'm bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Then he went on to say that, Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I'm not. Am I? He said, I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes, above measure, in prisons, more frequently, in debts often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes. At minus one, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I, I, am, I encountered night and day. I have been in the deep, in jails often, in perils, in what, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of uh, my own countrymen, in perils of gent um, Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among four brethren, in weariness and in toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Paul was saying that as an apostle, I've gone through stuff. And I'm saying that one of the true sons, the true apostles is that they are willing to suffer for the Lord. The next sign is that they are responsible for establishing doctrines in the church. A doctrine is a set of beliefs held and taught by a church, like the titan that we talk about these days and people don't understand. It's, it's, it's a doctrine, okay? Like faith, like baptism, like marriage. These are doctrines. But the apostles are responsible for establishing these doctrines in the churches. So Acts chapter 2 verse number 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So the apostles' doctrines. So the apostles, they establish doctrines. So the church continues steadfastly in their doctrines. All right? And so in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 7, For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. Paul, an apostle, was a teacher of the Gentiles, and he was appointed a preacher and an apostle. Apostles are appointed to establish doctrines by the messages they teach and they preach. The next sign of the apostles is that they have power over demons. My goodness, I love them this bit. You see, a real apostle, when he enters into a place, if demons have really um, great people and they have subjected them to all kinds of things, by the anointing of the apostle, he's able to demand the release of those people. So Luke chapter 9, and verse number one, then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. These were the apostles that were with Jesus. He gave them power over evil spirit and to cure all diseases. Praise the Lord. The next um, sign of the apostle is that they move in miracles. And a miracle is an, an extraordinary event that occurs which is inexplicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore attributed to a divine agency okay that's a miracle somebody's um, 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 leg is amputated like um, 
a story I had about one great man of God of blessed memory, and, and, and his mentor what goes what. He had a conference, and when it was done, uh, preaching, they were taking him to his car when they brought somebody who had just had an accident and the leg was amputated. And then he, they wanted him to pray. They asked him in, in his quest to enter into his car, uh, what is the shoe size? And he said, size um, um, 30 something. And then he said, go purchase a shoe and let him wear. And he said, the leg is, the feet is amputated. He said, listen to my instruction. And he turned and moved into the car. They went and bought the shoe. While they were putting the shoe on the feet, new feet green. It's a miracle. No scientist, science, um, scientist can uh, explain this. It's purely a miracle. And that's the sign of an apostle. Okay? So Acts 2, verse 43. Then faith came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So apostles, they do, God uses them to do signs and wonders and miracles. Okay, the next um, sign is that they have authority to bring correction sometimes to the church of Jesus Christ. Apostles come with correction. So 1 Corinthians 5, verse 3 to 5. For indeed, as absent in body, but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present. Him who has so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one um, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, in the church of Corinth, you know, you know the story. Um, um, all kinds of other things contravening God's decrees were happening in the church. And so, uh, because of what was happening in those days in the church, um, it had happened that um, um, Paul was um, told, or they wrote a letter to him while he was in prison, and his quest to um, solve the problem. He said that you, you cannot continue like this. A man was sleeping with his father's wife. And so Paul said that that person should be dealt with. And so Paul brought correction to the church as an apostle. Hallelujah. All right, so that is uh, the sign um, of the apostle. Um, we um, have in the Bible some kinds of apostles, okay? Like um, um, Jesus Christ is an apostle, okay? He, he, on his early ministry, the Bible refers to him as an apostle, Hebrews 3.1. And therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. So Jesus is an apostle, okay? And so, um, if Jesus is an apostle, don't be scared when God has called you to an apostolic ministry to respond fully to the call. In our world, they will scorn at it and they will say all kinds of bad things about it. But hey, if Jesus is an apostle, if he calls you into the apostolic ministry, you can really hear to it and do just that. Hallelujah. So that is the apostolic ministry. And then from that, we come to the prophetic ministry. We come to the prophetic ministry. Um, we're talking about the fivefold ministries, you see. Um, and I want to say this quickly that you can see that the prophetic is part of the ministry Jesus gave. So this notion that because one, two, three prophets have done something else and contravening God's decrees um, makes the prophetic look like it is demonic, the prophet was not given by the devil, it was given by Jesus. So we have the prophetic ministry part of it. Okay? Um, um, Jesus Christ is the chief prophet. Okay? So the Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. This is what Moses is talking in the Old Covenant. He said, God will raise a prophet just like him from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Then Jesus was born. And on the same the ministry, we saw a couple of things about him that really portrayed that he was the actual person Moses was talking about. So in Acts chapter 3, verse 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, and this was Peter talking. He said, For Moses truly said to your fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says. Now, so Peter retreated what Moses said some thousands of years ago in the, in the wilderness. And that the one Moses spoke about is Jesus Christ. This is interpreting scriptures in light of other scriptures. Letters. Okay, so um, 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 Peter is making it emphatic that the one Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15 is Jesus. So Jesus is a prophet. Praise the Lord. Examples of Jesus' prophetic ministry. In Mark chapter 10 verse 32 to 33, now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was going before them and they were amazed. As they followed, they were afraid. 
Then Jesus took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. Now, the prophet foretells, the prophet tells of what has happened, what is happening, and what is yet to happen. Here, Jesus was moving with his disciples, and then he, he gathered them somewhere and tells them that these are the things that are going to happen to me. I will be betrayed. I will be sold up to the high priest, and then they will perfect me, take me through so many moments of frustrations, and after that, I will be crucified. He spoke about his passion, and it did happen to tell you that he was a prophet person and the things that he said prophetically came to pass. Okay? A couple of examples about his prophetic ministry, like in John chapter 1, verse 40 to 48, a long portion of scripture that I would love to read. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him um, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated the stone. Jesus had never met Peter before. Andrew, hearing about Jesus, went and invited Peter, his brother, to come over, to come see Jesus. And as soon as Jesus saw him, he said, He said, Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. I've never met him before, but I mentioned his name and told him the name of his dad. You are Simon, your father is Jonah. And you shall be called Cephas, which is translated the stone. You know, the name Simeon means to hear. And people who love to hear are the wish worship tipsy terribly, inconsistent kind of people. Okay? So Jesus was trying to tell him that because you are inconsistent and you are the tipsy type of person and you always want to hear things. I stabilize you by giving you a new name called Sifas. Sifas is a fraction of a stone. Making the stones are very um, stabilized. So he was trying to tell you that I stabilize your life from today. What I'm saying is that this is Jesus prophesying on a man he had never met before. Moby down, is it that then the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Philip and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel, his brother, and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophet wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to his brother, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, had never met him before, and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no God, or in whom is no deceit. Jesus never um, had never met with um, Nathaniel before, but as soon as I saw him, he said that you are an Israelite. It's like, I meet you, I don't know you, and the first thing I say is that you are an Ebe. Okay? And um, 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 Nathaniel said to Jesus, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Behold, before Philip called you when you were under the tree, the fig tree, I saw you. That's prophetic. So Jesus operated in the prophetic. In John chapter 4, the verse 17 through 19, when Jesus had a discourse with the Samaritan woman, and the Bible says that the woman answered and said to Jesus, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not yet your husband. In that you spoke truly, the woman said to him, Said, I perceive that you are a prophet. When Jesus told the woman explicitly and spot on what she was going through in her life, they know her for the first time and started telling her things about her. The woman looked at her and said, that, My, I perceive that you are a prophet. So Jesus was prophetic. Few things about the prophets. Prophets speak by the influence of the Holy Spirit. Prophets, they speak by the influence of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 1, verse 67, now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, you cannot prophesy until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So prophetic people who operate in the prophetic ministry are full of the Spirit. And so I just want to digress and say that. Be very careful of anyone who calls himself a prophet or operates in the prophetic ministry, ladies and gentlemen, and that person 
it's not filled with the spirit. These days we have a lot of things happening on TV and on radio. You look at them, you listen to the things they say, you watch them and you can see there isn't anything like spirit filled um, 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 in them. But, but, but a real prophet must be filled with the spirit like we read about Zachariah. The Bible said because he was full of the Holy Spirit, then he prophesied saying. You cannot prophesy saying until you are filled with the spirit. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by them by the Holy Spirit. If you are watching me outside this country, Ghana, there has been a lot of confusion about the prophetic to a point where recently the IGP on the 31st uh, made um, a declaration that every prophet that um, prophesies um, and, and, and brings in panic and fear um, will face um, the rigor of the law. Though he did not say that nobody should prophesy. But I think um, our system needs to be educated a bit. So there's something that we have to understand about the prophets. Second Peter 1.21 For prophecy never came by the will of man. It's not the will of man that makes the man prophesy. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved with them. As they were moved with them. By the Holy Spirit. So if the man is moved by the Holy Spirit, yet the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, but then this is the Holy Spirit moving the man. The spirit of the prophet, I'm, I'm a tripartite being. I'm a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body. I can control my spirit, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon me and is moving through me, and so, prophets are moved by the Spirit to prophesy. Three ways of being moved by the Spirit. Praying more in tongues. Who we'll move a prophet by the Spirit to prophesy. Reading Bible and getting deeply acquainted with scriptures because the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And then walking with and listening to spiritual men. When spirit filled people, iron sharpened iron, walk with wives that you may be wives, a companion of who shall be destroyed by him. And so, if you get connected to spirit filled people, the unction on them could rub on you, and that can move you into the spirit so you can really walk in the anointing and begin to flow in the prophetic. We're still on some few facts about the prophetic, okay? They were required to speak all of and only what God says. Prophets are required to speak all of and only what God says through the Ezekiel 3.10. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive unto your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. This was the prophet Ezekiel saying that I heard the voice of the Lord and God was telling me that moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you and hear with your ears. When God is speaking to you, He expects you to listen so you can really deliver exactly what He's told you to do. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 20 to 22. Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22. Still about some few facts about the prophetic. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, the prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know with the word which the Lord has spoken, has not spoken, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. So the next part about the prophetic is that if a real, authentic, repeated, anointed prophet of God is moved by the Spirit and is speaking, Certainly what he says, God says he should speak, would have to definitely come to pass. If he doesn't, the Bible says don't be afraid of him. He has spoken presumptuously. Okay. And so I want you to understand that the prophetic is authentic. I had recently uh, quite a couple of, of discussions going on that the prophets ended with the old covenant. Some also said that it ended with the book of Revelation after what? There isn't any authentic repeated prophet in our world today. And I tell them that's a lie because in the new covenant, even in the early church, there were prophets. Acts 13, the verse number one, 
Acts 13 and verse number 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. In the church of Antioch, in the New Covenant, in the book of Acts, there were certain prophets and teachers. Then the Bible took time to expatiate on who those prophets were. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manane, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And so, these were prophets in the early church. Okay? Like we read from Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, he gave gifts unto men, some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and then teachers for the perfecting of the same. And the other day, somebody took time to explain and said that the tongue represents the apostolic, and then after the tongue, you have the, the pointing finger, that's the prophetic, then the middle finger, that is the evangelistic, because all of us have to hit the Great Commission, but uh, the evangelist goes out more, and this finger is the tallest, so it goes out more, and after that, we have this finger, and they, they say there's a vein that joins this finger to the heart, so this is the, uh, the uh, on your left is the wedding band, that's where they put it, and so the real pastor, the minister of the pastor is, you know, connected to the church, he has the heart of the church and those things, and then this finger being the finger for, um, um, for teaching, um, um, it's believed that if you have wax in your ears, you remove them with this very finger, not with this one. So teachers, they come to teach you the word of God so that you can remove every wax out of your ears. But you realize that you cannot bypass any of these, you know, for the others to function appropriately, which means that all the fivefold ministries are supposed to work in collaboration. The teacher should not criticize the pastor. The pastor should not criticize the prophet. The prophet should not criticize the evangelist. We are in sync. Okay? The Fantis will say that you don't bypass a tomb to tie a knot. In San Kokomotimuna and Bopo. That is the proverb here in Ghana. Okay? Um, with the Fantis. Okay? So, if you want to tie a knot, certainly you need all the other fingers to be brought in together to be able to tie a knot. Which means that we can tangle and get the work done. Irrespective of the shortcomings of the evangelist, the preacher, the teacher, the prophet, the, the apostle, we still have to learn to agree to disagree sometimes so that together we can advance the work. So when I hear an evangelist criticizing the prophet, I'm like, do we, don't we know that we are together and, 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 and if you disgrace the prophet, you disgrace the evangelist? What we're supposed to do is to cover each other, watch each other's back and make sure that we preach somewhere that can really help our brother who's probably been ought or at, at fault to, to even make amends and do what is right. The Bible says in Galatians 7, the verse 1, that if even a brother um, 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 is at fault, let those of you who are spiritual bear the effect of the weaker ones. You see some of these people sitting on radio and TV claiming they've repented because they were bad prophets and blah, blah, blah. Well, if you have repented, praise God. Nobody's against that. But, but, but then they, they would criticize other pastors and the, the arrogance behind their critique. No, the Bible says that we do that in the spirit of meekness, lest we fall into the same temptations again. Okay, so the prophets are in the new covenant and they are in the church. Let me shock you with 1 Corinthians 12, 28. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church. It's not Satan who has appointed these. God has appointed these in the church. Number one, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. I don't know why people are cool with teachers, but they have problems with prophets. But God has appointed apostles, prophets, teachers. I hear somebody claiming to be a teacher and he's seriously and arrogantly blasting a prophet. But you and the prophet have all been appointed in the church. And so long as the church has not been raptured, the prophetic is still authentic as far as it's concerned in this 21st century. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. We had Agabus in the early church. In Acts chapter 11, verse 28, who prophesied about uh, the famine that was coming in the days of Claudius Caesar. We had Anna, the days of Jesus when he was born. Anna was a prophetess. In Luke chapter 2, 36 to 37, that means that women can be prophetic. We had Judas. And Silas in Acts 15 32. Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets also exalted and strengthened the brethren with many words. We had Philip's daughters, so women could also be prophetic. Acts 21 8 to 9. On the next day, 
we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Philip's daughters, they were virgin, four of them, and they prophesied. So women can also move in the prophetic. This was all because God had promised in the book of Joel that in the last days, I will part of my spirit in Joel 2.28, and their sons and daughters are prophesying. So we are in the last days, and the prophetic is authentic. You know, I've been talking a lot about the prophet, you know, but um, um, some few signs um, that you have to know. Okay, so I'll leave that. But um, um, the prophetic certainly has what we call false prophets too. Okay, we have false prophets too. Let me just zero in on that. I'll be dealing in depth about that, but there are false prophets too. Okay, and um, uh, five signs of false prophets. That will let you know that these are false prophets. Number one, they would deny the Lord. False prophets would deny the Lord, so you have to really check their doctrines if they are straying from the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter 2, 1 and 2. But there were also false prophets among people, even as there will be false teachers among you. So false prophets and false teachers who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. And so we have false prophets and one of the signs of false prophets is that they deny the Lord Jesus and they bring in heresies and they teach strange doctrines like teachings like there is no heaven. Teachings like God has never called any prophet or anybody. Meanwhile they are prophet themselves. So when I heard one prophet said that my question was that so then who called him? Because God is always calling people. He called Samuel three times and when he was not hearing, he would go to Eli and Eli would tell him, go, I have not spoken, I have not called you. And three consecutive times. And the last time when Eli told him, I go, kneel down, lie down and when you hear the voice, say, speak for thyself and hear it. God is always calling. He called Abraham on the Mount of Moriah, I think twice. Abraham, Abraham. God is calling. He called Moses. God calls people. So I'm surprised. So when you hear people giving such teachings, then you have to really be careful of them. Another sign of a false prophet is that the prophesy lies in God's name. Jeremiah 14, 14. And the Lord said to me, the prophet prophesy lies in my name. When the prophesy lies in the name of the Lord, it's a sign that they are false. And then Deuteronomy 18, 21, 22. If their prophecy don't come to pass, then it means that that's false. And then number four, if they teach the doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter days some will depart from faith, giving heed to deceiving spirit and doctrine of demons. When some prophets are teaching the doctrines of demons, when they exalt uh, some things that are not necessary than the name of Jesus, okay? We can disagree on some few things, okay? But the main things must become the main thing. I mean, you don't talk the blood of Jesus, you don't talk the Holy, you don't talk the Holy Ghost baptism, you don't talk tithes, you don't talk faith. You don't touch assurance of faith. These are doctrines that you don't touch. If you see a prophet speaking against these things, then I'm afraid um, the background would have to be really looked at. And then um, we look at the fruits they bear. The fruits they bear. Matthew 7, 15 and 18, by their fruits you shall know them. Okay. Yeah. So that is um, for uh, the prophetic ministry. Uh, we want to look at the evangelistic ministry. That is the number three. The evangelistic ministry. I'll be coming uh, to the prophetic because it's a prophetic you know um, ministry teaching we're doing but i just want to first of all teach you the fivefold ministries now let you know the prophetic is from god then afterwards we can major on the prophetic i hope you are really uh, getting me so then we can major on the prophetic okay so um the the ministry of the evangelist that's the thing an evangelist is a proclaimer of the gospel of jesus christ and jesus christ here is also the greatest evangelist. Okay? So in Mark chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, 
and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. This is the preaching of an evangelist, and Jesus did that to prove to us that the evangelist ministry is authentic, because he himself is an evangelist too. Luke chapter 4, verse 43. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. It's an evangelist. It's a purely an evangelistic mandate. So Jesus is not just an apostle. He's not just a prophet. He's also an evangelist. I love that. So if you've been called into the evangelist ministry, your senior brother is Jesus. He is your, he is your mentor. And so don't be um, um, shy to respond fully to the call. Philip, the evangelist, was led by the Holy Spirit to evangelize, you know, the um, Ethiopian Enoch, okay? And so, um, 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 in Acts chapter 21, verse 8, the Bible talks about um, the fact that on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Zaria and entered the house of Philip the evangelist. So the Bible refers to Philip as an evangelist. I think he's the only one, apart from Jesus, who was referred to as an evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He was a deacon, but he was evangelistic. And God called him to the evangelistic ministry. And here in Acts 21, verse 8, the Bible accords to him that kind of ministry, the evangelistic ministry. You know, and so a couple of things about Philip that should let evangelists know. Okay, since he was called um, an evangelist. In Acts chapter 8, verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scriptures which Jesus to him. When he met the champion, you know, because he was an evangelist, he preached Jesus. Real evangelist priests preaches Jesus. It's unfortunate today in my country where I am in Ghana, the so-called evangelists, they preach some strange messages. I recall once I was driving past a certain area and I saw a certain man who claims to be an evangelist and was preaching, man, if you wear um, a short skirt, hair straight. If you wear a woman, hair straight. In Ghana, they say, oh, James, straight. If you wear a lipstick, hair straight. If you, um, what else? Um, um, yeah, if you wear um, acrylic fingers, hell straight. If you wear bone straight, hell straight. I was like, if this woman has the privilege of traveling to the U.S. V, I, I think he would end up putting everybody in hell. You know, our objective is to preach Christ and His love. And when the love of Jesus entered into the heart of the person, then the person will know whether I have to change my clothes. I should not do this again or do that again. It's all about preaching Jesus Christ. And he crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven, and is coming back again. That is the work of the evangelists. These days, in my country, in Ghana, it's like it's been the norm. If you're an evangelist, you have to insult people. So the evangelists in my country, they insult. When they are preaching, they insult prophets, they insult pastors, they insult evangelists, teachers, they insult politicians. Then people know that they are uh, evangelists where they are the you. No, 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 no. We're not called to insult. We're called to love people and to preach the love of Jesus. Acts chapter 8, verse 6 to 8. And the multitude would want to call, indeed, the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing miracles with he did. For unclean spirit crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lay were healed. And there was great joy in the city. They moved in healings. They moved in, in miracles. Real evangelists, they moved in miracles. They moved in miracles. Paul also exhorted Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. So in 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 5, But you be watchful in all things, and do your afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. I believe Timothy was an evangelist and Paul was trying to hammer on it and he emphasized on that and told him that you must do the work of an evangelist because that's your calling. You should be able to do the work of an evangelist. Then this brings us to the fourth ministry, the pastoral ministry. Pastoral ministry. The ministry of the pastor. Uh, we call it the ministry of the shepherd. Okay? The ministry of the shepherd. One who cares for the people of God. A shepherd is the one who cares. I mean, if you've gone to 
uh, the areas where they rear cattle and all those, you see how the shepherd you know, tends and takes care of the, of the sheep and the cattle. That's the work of a shepherd. And Jesus, again, is also used in relation to um, the shepherd ministry as the chief shepherd. Okay, so First Peter 2.25 for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Jesus is called the shepherd and overseer of our soul. So again, Jesus um, is a pastor. He's a shepherd. And so if you've been called into the um, pastoral ministry, don't feel withdrawn and relaxed. And just go ahead and obey the calling on your life. Because Jesus, after all, is also the shepherd of our lives. Jesus is the good shepherd. In John chapter 10 verse 11, I am the good shepherd. He said himself. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The pastor gives his life for the sheep as the work of a pastor. Okay? The pastor uh, doesn't normally travel too much. The pastor all the time wants to really be in church and all the time, half time for the people, goes to the people's house, visits them. That's a real pastor. He, he lays down his life for the members. Jesus, the great shepherd, Hebrews 13, verse number 20, now made the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead. That great shepherd, the Bible called Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So Jesus is called the great shepherd. I think every pastor would have to learn much about Jesus, his love, how he dealt with people, like when the Samaritan woman met with him, how he spent time with her to really ensure that by the time she left, she had really got a confidence to go confront the Bible. Says she went to the city of Samaria and preached to the men and brought the men to Jesus. Now, this was a woman who had been abused by men. They marry her and they divorce the marriage. And because of that, she didn't have any more confidence to even go out there to um, the world to go fetch water. She would do that in the afternoon. She wouldn't do that in the evening where all the women and men were in town because she didn't know that they were going to laugh at her. But she so was transformed after meeting Jesus that she went straight to the city, not preach to women, but preach to men. Now, if you can confront your fears and confront people of abuse, which means that there's been a real rejuvenation, a real rejuvenation and a real transformation within you. And I'm saying that that's the work of a pastor. When they are able to come to a level, condescend to low, men of low estate and work on you, like in the case of the woman who was caught in adultery, everybody wanted to stone her, but Jesus spent time and worked on her and told everybody who that has never committed any blunder before should be the first to cast the stone on this woman. Everybody fled. And the Bible says that Jesus asked the woman, has anyone condemned you? The woman said, no, Jesus, I don't condemn you either. That's the work of a pastor. Hallelujah. And Jesus is the great shepherd. So in Ephesians 4 11, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors. So some have been called to be pastors. And I believe there are some few pastors watching me today. This is your calling. Hallelujah. Yeah, shepherd contrasts with highly. Yeah, so three facts about shepherds. John 10, 12 to 13. But the highly, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hyaline flees because he is a hyaline and does not care about the sheep. This is the three things that you have to know. A pastor owns the sheep. A shepherd owns the sheep. Yeah. A hyaline sees himself as I'm hired. See, that's why I recall some two young men came to me and they said that uh, we are called by God to come and serve in your ministry. I want to know how much you pay us. I told them, I didn't call you, go to your own call you and let him pay. These are hidings. Such people, when you put them on the job or send them anywhere, any little problem, they'll run away and leave the church. But real shepherds, in spite of adverse circumstances, they'll be there and they'll stand. I sent a couple of pastors to some cities to go plant branches for them. They took my salary for one year and after that they left the church and fled. Went somewhere and did their own thing. These were hirings. They were not real shepherds. So a shepherd owns a sheep. When wolves are coming, the shepherd sees and stays to fight for the sheep like David. When the wolves and the bears were coming after and the lambs were coming against his father's sheep, what he did was that he fought them the land on the bed. A highland does not care about the sheep. Meanwhile, the Bible tells us we are to be diligent to know the state of our flock and to attend to our hearts. In Proverbs 27, verse number um, 23. 
Those who are shepherds are weary in life. That's the next thing that you have to understand. Every pastor would have to, every Christian would have to have a pastor over his or her life. So Matthew 9, 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. If people don't have shepherd, like sheep without a shepherd, they become weary, they become worried, they become frustrated. That's why when I hear people saying that I don't need to go to a church, I don't need a pastor, I can stay in my home and grow as a Christian after all, I'm sure soon I remember. I look at them and I say, no, no, you must have a pastor of your life. Otherwise you'll be weary in life. You get tired in life. You need someone who can preach the word of God to you, work on you, speak to you, encourage you, motivate you, spare you on once in a while. Everybody needs a prophet, a pastor in his or her life. And God promises the church good pastors. Jeremiah 3, verse number 15. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. May God give us pastors who are after God's own heart and will feed us with knowledge and understanding. Ezekiel 34 verse 5 to 6. Pastors keep flock together. Pastors, they keep flock together. They don't create confusion and they don't sow discords and, 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 and resentments among the believers. But they, they, they bring them together. Pastors must lead the flock by example. First Peter 5, 2 and 3. They lead the flock by example. And then um, and, and, and pastors or shepherds are willing to lay down their lives for the sheep. Okay, that is in John chapter 10, verse 11. And then, um, finally, shepherds are told to feed the flock of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Therefore, take heed, this Paul telling the Christians and church of Ephesus, when they came and to escort him and by the, by the shore, he knelt down, was weeping on their shoulders and praying for them. He told them, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So pastors are encouraged to feed the flock of Jesus. The reward of pastors, because I respect pastors a lot. You know, they spend time with the members. I respect them a lot. And so because their work is so tedious, there are rewards also for them. In 1 Peter 5, the verse numbers 3 um, to 4. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being example to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Pastors will receive the crown, the crown of glory that does not fade away. And then, finally, the ministry of the teacher. That is the last on the list, the ministry of the teacher. And that is, and the teacher is one who is gifted to teach the word of God, like Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is also a teacher. Okay? But a teacher is someone gifted to teach the word of God like I'm doing today. Okay? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel. He was teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among the people. But Jesus went about teaching and healing and preaching. So he taught. So Jesus is a teacher. And so Jesus taught on his early ministry, then if you call you into the teaching ministry, you got to really respond fully to it. Mark chapter 1 and verse number 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So Jesus taught as one with authority. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then in Acts chapter 13 verse 1, there were prophets and teachers in the church of Antioch. Yes. So um, he says that now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Glory to God. You see? So the work of the teacher is very, and I tell people that a false teacher is more dangerous than a false prophet. As a false prophet will tell you to go do something, you can decide not to do. But a false teacher can indoctrinate you and tell you to put a bomb in your clothes and go and sit in an airplane of about 500 people and bomb them. And when you bomb them and you die, you will be given 12 virgins when you go to heaven. 
a serious indoctrination. So teachers are more, false teachers are more dangerous than false prophets. I don't know why people measure so much on false prophets and don't even think about false teachers. And yes, we are false teachers. That's why in James 3 verse 1, the Bible says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a strict judgment. Because wrong teachings are very dangerous and can cause people to go to hell. So the Bible says that we should not be hasty to call ourselves teachers. Okay? Paul taught in Antioch, Corinth, and Rome. According to Acts chapter 1, chapter 11, verse 26, and Acts 15, 35, Acts 18, verse 11, and then Acts chapter 28, verse 31. Apollos taught, yes, and um, the elders in the early church also taught. So Titus chapter 1, verse 9 says that, holding fast the, faith, the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by some doctrine both to extend and convict those who contradict the gospel. You see, so we need teachers in our time. So in 2 Timothy 2:15, the Bible says that we should be diligent. Okay, to present ourselves and prove to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We should be able to divide the word of truth. And that comes by we stating the word so we will be able to be in the position to divide the word of truth. I've been able to talk to you about the five ways of identifying your calling. Are you in the apostolic ministry? Are you in the prophetic ministry? Are you in the evangelistic ministry? Are you in the pastoral ministry? Are you in the teaching ministry? You got to decide okay, for what I've taught you, dependent on your calling, your strength, your acumen, your expertise, your passion, and you know which area God has called you into. I'm excited. My name is Bishop Edwin Lewis Goodman. And uh, the church is at Rima Calvary Center, Calvary ACPA in Accra, opposite the Hatton Ship. If you want more of these, I'm inviting you to be part of us on Sunday at exactly 8 in the morning. And then this and every Saturday, I'll be sharing this on all my portals. Let's get connected and God is sending God bless you. I bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Next week I'll be dealing with the four realms of the prophet ministry. Oh God.